So we'll be happy to take some questions. Yes. So I have a question and a comment. My question is, I would like to understand better the time of the birth of Israel, how David Ben-Gurion permitted this separation of the ultra-Orthodox from the responsibilities to the country, because it would seem the longer it goes on, the harder it is to change it, but how is it sustainable that all Jews, if you want to have a place where Jews can live as Jews, you would think some are more observant, some are less observant, but everybody has to contribute for the state. That's true. How do you change this? And how did it get started? So, so it started with 300 people. So Ben-Gurion gave, um, how do you say that, um, credit or he gave a uh, release, a waiver to 300 yeshiva boys who were s defined by the government as excelling in their studies. So it was supposed to go to 300 genius who their Bible studies is really important for, you know, for the... It is important that we're not going to deny that you need, you definitely need, you know, groups of people that will keep on the tradition and will delve into the studies of the, of our history and our heritage. It's highly appreciated. And what happened is the number was 300 people uh, for many, many years. In the 80s, um, I don't have the historic reference with, with me, but the, the, the floods were open. And... Instead of allowing 300 people, they allowed to anyone who wants to keep his studies to register as, um, as a yeshiva boy. And uh, obviously since then, it's been, um, the numbers have been really, really high. So one of the big, so what happened, um, you know, after this 80s decision and the numbers grew up until the 90s, and then at the 90s, one of the civic engagement groups, uh, like civil society groups, NGOs, uh, went to the high court of Israel and said, come on, this is not equal rights because, you know, secular kids has to go for 30 months or so. Again, my son is 18. He will go in August. My daughter, is she's 15. She will have to go, you know. It's not, they're not, it's not even for their choice. My dad was in the military, by the way, career military, and I was combat, in combat myself. I mean, not in combat, but I was in a combat role, um, far away from the house and everything. Some groups took it to the high court in the 90s. The high court ruled that Israel must be a, a state where things are equal. And it ruled in favor of, those, of this group. And the court said that the Knesset has to come up with a specific bill that will, you know, that will define who is entitled to be a yeshiva study uh, boy or yeshiva study uh, youth. Now, uh, the high court said to the Knesset, you have to enact this bill. And since then, it's almost, you know, it's 20 years now, more than 20 years, the Knesset has been debating back and forth about this bill. And this bill, it's called the Chok Tal, the Tal bill. Uh, it's not under my name. It's under the judge. The judge who ruled this. His name was Tzvi Tal. Um, so they gave a bill under his name, but the bill never passes. It passes maybe first round, then it doesn't pass the second round, it back and forth. One of the reasons that the... 20th Knesset was dissolved and went into election in April was because one of those head of, uh, head of um, um, a party named Lieberman, Avigdor Lieberman, who used to be the Israel foreign affairs minister and Israel's defense minister, and he has, he's chairing a party that is comprised of Russian immigrants mostly, uh, Russian immigrants, the voters. Uh, we, have, we have one million, about from the nine million, we have about nine million, uh, one million people who came from Russia during the last, you know, two to three decades. So they're still, you know, heavily speaking Russian language and uh, not in enclaves anymore, but supporting one party. Um, and this group is secular. It's not a religious group. It's very secular, and it's very right-wing. It's a, not the liberal left. It's a right-wing nationalist group, but very, very secular. They're opposing rabbinical 
control. They're opposing, you know, they want the Shabbat, uh, you know, for the stores to be open, for transportation to be available, and so on. Um, he is chairing this uh, party, and he said to the ultra-Orthodox who are in the government, if you are, we are not passing this bill right now, I'm dissolving the government, and this is what he did. And uh, since then, his campaign has been very successful. He managed to go from five seats to eight seats in September only by declaring that he is unwavering on the draft bill and that he's unwavering on Shabbat rules and he's as well unwavering on transportation in Shabbat and stores in Shabbat and so on, conversion, uh, Western Wall access, and many other. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you are... Um, trying to look for the differences between Israel's different groups, and you start to ask them what what is the campaign about, what is the election about, you would think the Palestinian issue is on the top of the list or the threats from Iran, right? You know, people think, you know, Palestinian terrorists in the West Bank or Palestinians from Gaza or Iran with this huge threat. But, you know, surprise, no, big no. People are define themselves differently on those parties by the way they see the draft bill, by the way they look at Shabbat, by the way they look at, you know, civil duties rights, civil duties, uh, duties and, and, and rights. And um, it's quite amazing. It's religious and state, actually, which is going through as, you know, as, as, as a threat in all of those issues. Uh, how do you like your... Uh, I will explain a little bit further about the Shabbat thing because I told you the four tribes, each tribe look at Shabbat in a different way. You must understand in Israel, everything is closed down on Shabbat. So uh, not everything, everything, but almost everything. So for example, we do not have public transportation on Shabbat. So if I have youth at my house, 18 years old, 15 years old, they want to go to a party without getting mommy behind the wheel, right? They just want to go with their friends. There aren't any buses. They cannot get out of, we live in the suburbs. They just cannot get out of the suburbs and uh, unless they take a taxi, which is very expensive. So, I mean, uh, how do you solve that? Many parties in Israel have suggested that in very secular, heavily secular enclave cities, you will permit a transportation on Shabbat, but the transportation on Shabbat goes beyond because we have a major transportation crisis in Israel. We don't, you know, people are buying cars and there, there, is, there isn't enough room. The, the country is very clogged. I don't know how long it's been since you've been there, but every time you step out of the house if with your car, you are in a traffic jam. It's like a little LA, right? When you want to drive from one point A, point A to point B, you are two hours, right? There is no time of the day even midday, when it's not just about commute mornings and commute evening, right? It's all all day long traffic jams. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for the productivity of the people. So how can you how can you solve that? The government should suggest a better public uh, public transportation, better trains, better buses. But if you have public transportation six days a week and you don't have a public transportation the seventh day of the week. Everybody needs to buy a car. How are you going to visit your son in the base? How will you go to visit your grandma? How will you uh, do things uh, if... Uh, so the transportation crisis is never going to be solved without those Shabbat rules. So the Shabbat, the, the religious you know, distinction, it affects our economy. It's not, a, it's not only about being a religious or being a secular. It goes into our way of life. So I cannot permit myself as a person, even if I'm a green type of, you know, care about uh, environment and all, I cannot let go of my car, never, because I, don't, I do not want to get stuck in the house. Uh, sometimes the Chag, the holiday is two days, right? Like I told you, Rosh Hashanah, from Sunday until Tuesday, two, two days. Well, Will I stay in the house, um, you know, only be able to walk around like we used to do in medieval days? No, I need a car. So um, going back to the draft, they were trying to solve this. They actually came up with a bill. But obviously the Likud, uh, which is the, the, the party of the prime minister, they could not vote for the draft bill because they have the ultra-Orthodox party in their government. 
And the ultra-orthodox parties said, if this bill passes, this is the end of the government. We will step down. So they're unable to solve it. And actually, the Israeli Knesset is under, uh, how do you say that, under a deadline from the Supreme Court. It's been deadline after deadline after deadline. It's been going on for 25 years now. And like our budget in the United States. By the way, we don't have a budget because we don't have a government. So it's, it's not, it's, it's actually, it's kind of sad. Uh, I want to make one comment too. Mm -hmm. So 56 years and two months ago, my country, I believe, changed the direction forever when President Kennedy was assassinated. You always think, what would have happened if he wasn't assassinated? So when the Prime Minister of Israel was assassinated, Yitzhak Rabin, yeah. when he was assassinated, maybe he could have done something. I don't know, I don't have the background of that, but things might have been different. I have to tell you, I was there at the rally because it was a rally to support the Prime Minister because he was uh, taking in a lot of incitement. He was taking a lot of incitement from, from, from the Likud people, actually, from, from the, the right wing. But um, I was there because yeah, it was important for Israel to support the Prime Minister back then against this incitement. And I cannot tell you if, I, 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 I do not know. I, I think uh, as per solving our major problem with the Palestinians, Rabin was on a path, but he was having a lot of opposition. And uh, not just uh, opposition in the parliament, also real opposition on the streets. Of course, violent opposition because they killed him, but, um, it was also, you know, people also were demonstrating with their, uh, people on the right wing were demonstrating with a right to demonstrate and with their, you know, um, thinking different. And the Israeli people are not, um, there isn't any majority at the present for changes on, on the Palestinian front. And, uh, yeah, it's a huge problem, but I think, you cannot blame the Israeli people because they've been under, you know, rockets and terrorist attack at all times. So I can't tell you that Rabin would have succeeded. Uh, it's not sure. But definitely the Israeli left and Israeli liber liberals since then, since the assassination, have never, have never recovered. Never. Uh, no leader. I mean, Benny Gantz actually is the first time that someone is, has more of, of, of uh, a success for the first time since 1995, which was the assassination year. Uh, this is the first time that the Israeli left and secular uh, parties have managed to, okay, it's not winning because as I told you, it did not win, but they have managed to cause the other side to lose. And they were, they were all ready to open champagnes back in September because really it was uh, such an achievement to, to get the, the, the Likud to lose something. The Likud was on a winning, is on a winning streak for many years now. And it might, it might win as well in, in March, we'll see. I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Very nice. I learned so. Uh, we are aware, of course, of the uh, Trump uh, Kushner proposal. Mm -hmm. Now, from my naive point of view in the state of Iowa, it seems dead on arrival to me. I can't possibly see the Palestinians that ever agreeing to that. But, I don't know. Ought, do the Israeli people take that as a serious proposal? The, this Kushner thing? Um, I don't think so. I think no. I think they don't take it as a serious proposal. However, there is one portion of this plan that some of the Israeli people really want to implement, and this is the annexation. So what the Israeli people are thinking, not all of them, but big chunks, big, you know, you got to give it to them. They are very powerful, the right wing. Uh, they have power in the Knesset. They have power in politics. Many of them do believe that Israel should wholly reject the entire plan except annexation. The concept was, and I think it was also somewhat proclaimed by the ambassador Friedman. He did not say it like I'm saying it, but he said something very close to it, that since we all know the Palestinian side will reject everything, Israel has the permission to proceed 
with annexing. And when I mean annexing, he doesn't, he doesn't say annexing, he says a different language, it's called sovereignty, sovereignty implementation or something like that. Uh, when you are, the Jewish settlements at the West Bank will be under Israel's sovereignty and also some other areas. So it doesn't mean annex the entire region. It means that you are annexing dots on the map, which is kind of weird, but it causes the Palestinian so-called future state to be, you know, dotted with, you know, areas that they're not, it's not theirs. Then you need roads. You need to sort of put your sover sovereignty on those roads in order to get to those areas. And then... If you have 200 people living in this community, you need to put a platoon or, or a group of soldiers that will watch them in order to get there. Very, very complicated. They wanted, the right wing want to just, you know, go ahead and implement this kind of type of, of, of dotted sovereignty. And also you have the, um, what they call the, the settlement blocks. So along the map, there are some areas when it's not just dotted you know, settlements, but it's a group of settlements, and it's very close to the Israeli border. As, for example, Gush Etzion, I don't know if the name says something to you, Gush Etzion, it's between Jerusalem and Hebron, right? So it's a big you know, area where there is a lot of Jewish settlements and a lot of Jewish cities, and what they wanted to do is just get this block all together become an, under Israel's sovereignty. Now, Reading the plan, it's 180 pages. I read through, reading through the plan, it's written in a way that the Palestinians, even if they accept everything out there, they will never reach a state, for example. I mean, I mean even if the Palestinians were willing to negotiate, and even if the Palestinians had a leader that is capable, which they don't, they do not, because Abu Mazen right now is ailing, is very old, is corrupt, with the entire entourage is corrupt. I don't see him being, you know, putting aside Netanyahu and his unwillingness to promote the peace. On the other side, there's no one really to talk to. But even if he was willing to talk to the Israeli side, some of the clauses in this plan say, for example, that the Palestinian state will be um, demilitarized completely, and it will not touch terror, of course, and that's you know goes without saying that it needs to be. But then it has a sentence that says the sole right or the sole ability to make a decision if the Palestinians have dropped completely terror and incitement is lay, lying on the Israeli side. So the Israeli side gets to be the one that will make the call in, let's say, 10 years or so, whether the Palestinians have stopped completely inciting. Inciting means that, you know, their school system, and we're, we are not, not talking about the Israeli citizens, the Arab Israeli citizens, we are talking about the West Bank residents, the Palestinians. And Israel has the sole power to make a call if they have stopped inciting, which means, you know, Israel can always say, no, they haven't stopped inciting. And that's it. I mean, you don't have, a Pal for that clause, you will not have a Palestinian, I mean, it's like saying, never ever a Palestinian state, really. This is what it's saying. So is that a time bomb? No, no time, no time. No, not to the agreement. I mean, a time bomb, I mean, Oh, uh, okay. Let me say just one more thing. There isn't any type of contingency on Israel. So if the Palestinian side takes the plan and says, yes, let's, let's negotiate, let's do it, and Israel says, um, mm, I don't feel like negotiating this year. So there is not, not content. Israel, Israel doesn't have to, so the plan doesn't say Israel has to do anything. It doesn't have to declare it wants it. It doesn't have to say, to say or, or wish anything. It doesn't have, the, the Palestinians on the other side have four years to come up and say, I'm willing to join. The, the president gave them four years. To come, they're not talking to him at the moment. So he said, you know, I know you're not talking to me at the moment. Maybe you will talk to me in the future. I give you four years to think about it. But you know, it's, uh, the time frame only lays on them. It doesn't lay on the Israeli side. So the Israeli side want, wanted to go ahead and say, 
yeah, let's take, you know, part of the plan and, and proceed with it. Because until the Palestinian will reject it in four years, we can, you know, we can do some stuff. So this is the reason I'm thinking. And as a time bomb for the Palestinians Authority, yeah, I mean, we already see, we already see some, you know, the, the biggest problem for us is the Jordanian, really. Because uh, we have a peace with Jordan. The Jordanian king is now threatening not only uh, as a hearsay, he really says it on record on TV, to annul the peace accord. This is the Rabin peace accord from 1994. It's a huge achievement of the Rabin government, uh, an historical agreement between the father of the king, which is dead by now, uh, King Hussein. Uh, his son, uh, King Abdallah, uh, has said in an interview he gave here in the United States, this is a major achievement of my dad, the late, late, late king and Mr. Rabin, but I am now in a position where I'm going to annul the peace accord if Israel continue on building the settlements and so on. So for Israel, having this accord, you must understand this accord, if it's annulled, the implications for Israel's military budget is huge because the peaceful border that we now have is not going to be a peaceful border anymore. It means that Israel military is going to ha start to rethink everything st strategically. Uh, area, uh, it's 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 you know mind blowing. You know the devastation that we can have with you know canceling the peace accord. People say on the right wing, they say, ah, don't worry, he's just threatening. He's, he's not going to annul the peace accord because this is in his interest. But have you seen the Arab world in the recent? decade revolting so king of jordan may lose his kingdom over the palestinian issue because 60 percent of his populations are palestinians and if they will start to revolt against him they can topple you know they can topple the kingdom and then what what will we say i mean we'll say i mean it was just risky me i'm concerned you know i think i think the peace plan doesn't go anywhere but even when they put it out, I'm concerned that by the mere act of publishing this peace plan, the, the process with, the, with Jordan and the Palestinians may deteriorate because they will think that they have no hope and they will, you know, it may cause like a chain of event. And instead of, you know, they put the plan out, they say, you know, what can we lose from putting the plan out? Oh, yeah, we can lose a lot. We can go down to, it's not a ticking bomb as in, you know, West Bank, but it's a major, major, um, how do you say, um, geopolitical uh, event, troublesome event. So I was at a Cory Booker event uh, a couple of weeks ago. In, uh, we live in Mount Vernon, a little town east of here. East of here. Yes. And um, anyway. I've been to the original Mount Vernon. Yeah. <laughs> in Virginia, right? There might be one in every state. Yeah, it's but beautiful. But anyway, um, so I walked into where I was, and somebody said, "Did you are the Palestinians um, demonstrating outside? And Against Cory Booker? Well, there is a Senate bill that they want him to vote for, which is to um, take military aid from Israel because these students are going across, they were coming to Iowa, accusing Israelis of killing Palestinian children and, pa and women and old people and everything. And they were in a group and they sort of like hijacked our little meeting with Cory Booker at the beginning, he handled it. But they wanted him to vote for the Senate bill or against it, whatever it was. So, and then, but besides that, I've read about um, the the, pro, the two week program, the going back, and that they're now the um, sponsoring organization has to vet the students, the Jewish students who are coming mm. on it because they're um, in Israel then doing pro Palestinian demonstrations and things like that. Mm. And so I wonder, and I just read that one thing that a lot of people like about Bernie is that he's sort of pro-Palestinian. So I'm just wondering, like, within Israel, I mean, it's really bad press. Like, I'm sort of embarrassed sometimes 
about the way Israel treats the Palestinians. And I understand that Cory Booker gave a very good response of using the children as shields. And that, it, I, and I had to say something. I was totally unprepared and my voice was shaking more than right now. But I said, you know, there are two sides to every story. But these students, they started attacking me. They were from all over the country. Mm. And there were Palestinian students and there were some, I said, I could look around and see that it was my neighbors. I said, I think I'm the only Jewish person here. And they said, oh, no, you're not. And it was these students, these mm -hmm. pro-Palestinian Jewish students. So I just want to get your response to that. And how does really see that they're being perceived in the United States? OK. Um, I, I do not wish to talk on behalf of all Israelis, because I'm okay. definitely I'm not a governmental official, yeah. and I'm just a reporter. I can talk about the way I see it. Um, we definitely have a problem with the way you know things have, are handled. It's you know we are not um, in an easy position when you have a group of militants coming out from Gaza and rocketing the Israeli population on a daily basis, daily basis, and the military reacts definitely. It is it has more power. And, and obviously the reaction of the military sometimes uh, causes more damage on the other side. But what would the normal population would do if they're, can you imagine um, people sitting at Ontario and, and throwing rockets at Buffalo? What would the Buffalo people would do? They would just sit and, you know, wait for the rockets to come down on them? It actually happened once. It, it happened time. once? Right. But can you <laughs> can you think? I know, but how come? Well, can you question, can you think of a normal us, country? How come we don't our neighbors <laughs> and our fellows, you know, Jewish students don't know? I mean, I know feel like I know about this. But oh, I'm but sorry. They, you know, we don't read it in the news every day that there was a bomb. But you know, you know Gaza rocket. Gaza is controlled by a terror organization. It's not a government out there. It's a terror organization, and. I'm feeling, you know, horrible about about the casualties, and it's, you know what? It's not just casualties. Their daily lives right now are really devastating because they don't have jobs, they don't have money, they are closed in this region where they cannot get out, you know, from any sides. You do have a lot of Israeli people who are supplying food and medicine and driving kids to hospitals. But having said that, it, it, it is under the control of a terror organization who says in a written statement he is out to destroy the land of the Jewish. It's not something that they're even hiding. And you do have part of Israel government are willing to negotiate even with a terror organization. You, you know that uh, it's funny, one of, the, one of the claims against Netanyahu coming from the lefty Gantz, mm -hmm who was chief IDF during the Gaza war, by the way. But these days, the, the people in Gaza, the terror organization, how do they get money? They don't have jobs enough for everybody. People are, there is like 60% um, unemployment. So from what, you know, how do they make a living? They get, a lot of, they get some money from the government of Qatar in the... Qatar uh, in the in the Gulf. So how do they bring in the money? You, it's it's unbelievable. They bring it in suitcase, in cash. So who is the person that is opening the gates in the crossings and let the money in? You have any idea? This is the Israeli government. So the Israeli government actually enable a monthly millions, uh, tens of millions of cash flowing in. So, why, why do because if they will not do it, the people will starve to death. And I will tell you, this is not only out of pure, this is not out of pure care for their health. It's also because if they'll, it's horrible when I'm saying it, but if they'll starve to death and, and there will be diseases and there will be in, uh, infections, this will affect the entire region. <coughs> you can't have this uh, society collapsing. 
So <coughs> the situation there is really bad, but the, who, who is flowing the money in? It's Netanyahu doing it. So one of the claim from the actually from the <coughs> for, so for one of the claims against Netanyahu, they actually had a photo of the suitcase that being sent in, and this was one of the things that was really Netanyahu took a hard hit politically, hard hit for enabling that because people that are under rocket attack said, "How come you're letting the money flow in? You're saving them, and they buy." They, what do they do with the money? They go and buy more, you know, cement and rockets material, and they keep, you know, building tunnels. So, you know, I have to tell you, I know the Jewish students in the United States and the, the young generations are disengaged and upset with the Israeli people. Again, yeah, not all, but... Yes, I know, I know. We are, I think we are aware of this uh, situation. And uh, it, it is a huge problem because this is causing a huge rift between. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate that. And this is causing a huge rift between the. You know, I was. I had this slide about um, right. about uh, how there is a, a, a major rift these days between the U.S. Jewish community. So the Jewish community here is democratic heavily. 80%, I don't know what's going to happen to 20, 20, yeah, it was about 78% to 80% back in 2016. I, you know, I will not be surprised if the number against Trump in the Jewish community will be even higher than usual. Maybe not, but, but maybe yes. What? I think you're right. Even with, with that, it's, it's 80% or 78, it's a lot anyways. In 75%, it's a lot. Whereas... Trump popularity in Israel is just like skyrocketing, uh, really. And again, I'm not talking on my behalf. Just, you know, this is the numbers. So uh, with that, Trump had so some weird statements against the Jewish community in the United States about not being loyal and so on. And you would expect the Israeli prime minister to be more of caring, but he didn't. Um, Talking to Netanyahu people, I think they are very aware of, of the rift. And uh, yes, it's not good. It's not good for us. It's not good for Israel as a society to be in a rift with the U.S. Jewish community. And it's not good for the Jewish, U.S. Jewish community to be, you know, in such, you know, feelings about the way Israel conducts itself. With the military aspect of the things, I understand the criticism, but I do think that Israel society at the moment have, doesn't really have a choice. Uh, this is what any other normal democracy would do if it would be under such attacks at all times. I agree uh, with that 100%. I'm sorry? I agree with you 100% about the right of Israel to defend itself. Right. Itself. I do think that the Jewish students, and, and there are some, yeah, this is a democracy too, okay. is a small number of the Jewish population in the United States. It is true that some go around and They're vocal more right so now. I can tell you also that the Israelis are very, very worried about Bernie Sanders in Israel. They're looking at, you know, this is one of the reasons I'm here actually to report, and I've been, I'm being asked about it at all times. I think himself is maybe okay with lots of things, including the way he talks about Israel, but the people that surround him the people that he chose as his, you know, uh, immediate circle, they are, um, you know, giving the Israeli people a bit of, uh, how do you say that, edge or, uh, you know, um, tense. Yeah, they are intense about Ilan Omar. They are intense about Linda Sarsour. Um, what can I say? I don't have too many positive words. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, I, not to end on a bad note, I want us to all go upstairs. We have a nosh upstairs. Hopefully you can Thank chat you. a little bit more with everybody, maybe talk a little bit more about the relationship sure. between Israel and the United States when we get up there. But this is really quite incredible. Thank Great. you so much for being here. Um, Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.